Well, it may turn out to be a where were you at the moment that you heard that the long saga of Julian Assange's persecution by the governments of the Western world, the participants in war after war, crime after crime, were considering dropping the case against the world's greatest publisher, the world's biggest political prisoner, although he's a political prisoner invisible in the country in which he's being held. No media, none ever concentrates on the fact that in a dungeon in London, the world's most famous journalist, most famous publisher is incarcerated now for well over a decade. But you may come to remember today as a red letter day. The Australian Parliament and government have asked the United States and the UK to halt proceedings against Julian Assange and to set him free after well over a decade of one form of incarceration or another. The Rose Garden has been the scene of many important announcements, and this one may turn out to be the latest. Joe Biden was shuffling along, as is his wont, uh, in the Rose Garden, in the pathway, and someone shouted from the journalistic crowd, have you a response to the Australian request for the dropping of the proceedings against Assange? Without looking, Biden, still shuffling, merely said, we are considering it. Now, on the face of it, that might be a very auspicious statement indeed. Although, as I joked earlier, he might have misheard. He might have thought he was being asked if he needed to go to the lavatory, as is his want, oftentimes during the day. And if he can't make it, as in the case of the Pope, he just does it there and then. It may be, though, that the long calvary of Julian Assange is coming to an end. If so, the compensation will have to be mighty big. Julian Assange has been metaphorically nailed to a cross almost all of the years. In fact, all of the years, bar one month, that I have known him, and that is a very long time indeed. Julian Assange was falsely imprisoned falsely accused. His extradition, first to Sweden and then to the United States, was falsely pursued. Sir Keir Starmer was one of the falsifiers. Sir Keir Starmer, the next Prime Minister, one presumes, certainly he presumes, uh, of the, the United Kingdom, when Director of Public Prosecution, egged on the Swedish prosecutors in their attempt to extradite Julian on entirely fake, bogus rape and other sexual assault charges. This is no time to go weak, he said. Hold your nerve, keep it up. It was an entirely contrived set of circumstances, from accusation to the process itself. Fearing extradition to Sweden, from which he would have been promptly extradited to the United States, for the real uh, offence that he is said to have committed, namely telling the truth about war crimes in Afghanistan and Iraq, revealing to the public the kind of crimes that were routinely being committed by their own governments. That was his real crime, the crime of journalism. He was effectively accused of journalism, and that's why they wanted him in Sweden, that's why they wanted to extradite him onwards to the United States. So he took refuge in the embassy of Ecuador in central London, just behind the Harrods uh, flagship store in London's Knightsbridge. The long period cooped up in that tiny room, in that tiny embassy, don't be misled by the word embassy, it was a ground floor flat in a mansion building in central London, one tiny part of which was occupied by Julian Assange, where he received many visitors from around the world, including me, my wife, and some of my children. 
we thought that he might be there for some considerable time because we were unsure that the United States would ever have a government that would either drop the intention to extradite him or even pardon him. We thought that in the case of Donald Trump, he might drop the charges, he might pardon Julian, though nothing in the end came to pass on that. It's my understanding that the deep state in the United States threatened, blackmailed Donald Trump, that if he were to pardon Julian Assange, he himself would pay the price. And at that point in time, Trump already had plenty on his plate. And then Joe Biden continued the Calvary. He continued the persecution. A Democratic president continued to try and extradite and send to a hanging jury in Virginia, the world's greatest journalist. I said many times on this show that I could not see how that could possibly be in Joe Biden's interest. It would lose him even more of the support already dwindling amongst a certain caste of people in the United States. It would create a cause celebre in the heart of an election year if he had to deal with a journalist in chains coming down the stairs of an aircraft from London and then seeing that journalist put on trial, a swift and entirely unjust trial, few have any doubt. I argued for a long time that the best thing for Biden, the best thing for the Democrats, and of course, coincidentally, the best thing for the world would be for the United States to drop these charges. We'll be talking to two men who have been intimately involved in this case right from the beginning, Chris Hedges and the Honorable Craig Murray, about this story later in the show. Today, on Eid Day, having slaughtered 14 children overnight, Israel slaughtered several more in the beach camp in Gaza. Six of their victims were the children and grandchildren of the Hamas leader, Ismail Hania, a man I have met. These children lived in the refugee camp, as indeed did Hania, before getting out of the country and heading for Qatar, where he now lives. His children stayed behind in the refugee camp, and their children with them. They were driving an ordinary car in the beach camp today when a carefully targeted strike from the Israeli occupation army took them all out in one go. In a blaze, six of the issue of Ismail Hania were destroyed. I've seen the pictures of where he was visiting wounded people in Qatar, where they'd been flown for medical attention when he got the call on speakerphone that his children and grandchildren had been murdered by the Israeli armed forces. To say he was a picture of serenity and acceptance and submission and courage would be a severe understatement. He immediately responded uh, with the words that his children were not more valuable than the other children that had been slaughtered in Gaza. He went on to say that all of the children who had been slaughtered were his children too. He went on to thank God for his children and grandchildren being placed on the pathway to heaven, arising out of their father's struggle for the liberation of the Palestinian territory, and in particular, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. He thanked God for this martyrdom. He said that it would make no difference to the struggle for Palestine's liberation, and surely it will not. I'm not sure of the thought process that went into 
the decision to murder the family of Ismail Haniya, a man that Israel is right this minute negotiating with through third parties in Cairo for a ceasefire for the release of hostages and for a temporary, at least, end to this particular chapter of the conflict. I'm not sure if they were doing it deliberately to wreck the negotiations, to make sure that none of their own hostages were to be freed and to come home freely to speak about what happened to them, who it was that sheltered them, who it was that tried to kill them. I'm not sure if it was a deliberate act by Netanyahu himself or by elements in the armed forces who are determined to stop any kind of deal being reached in Cairo. I'm not sure that there's anybody in the Israeli leadership stupid enough to believe that killing his children and grandchildren is going to make Ismail Haniya give up the struggle to liberate Palestine. I'm not sure if there's anybody in Israel stupid enough to believe that this will make Hamas less popular in Gaza than they are at this point in time. Killing children and grandchildren who could easily have escaped and could easily, like the son of Netanyahu, be living in five-star luxury in a hotel somewhere way, way offshore, but chose instead to remain in their hovel in a refugee camp where they could be killed at any moment in time, either deliberately targeted or not. I'm not sure if there's any idiot in Israel who thinks Hamas is weakened by this act of mass murder of children uninvolved in any of the politics, any of the armed struggle against occupation. These were civilians. These were uninvolved family members. I'm not sure if Israel consulted its allies, including Joe Biden, as to whether this particular strike would help or hinder his re-election, which more than ever before now hinges on a scaling down of America's overseas wars, which are now so unpopular that scarcely 20% of those who would normally vote Democrat support his policy of arming and protecting Israel over these last six months. I'm not sure if there's anybody there who was consulted who may not want Joe Biden to be re-elected. All of these things are up in the air, as are the missiles, the bombs, the rockets, the warplanes, the warships, the tanks on the ground, the heavy artillery just across the line now that the Israeli forces have withdrawn from the theater itself, they're raining down death and destruction on unprecedented numbers of entirely defenseless civilian men, but mainly women and children. This ghastly, obscene, horrific series of massacres will live forever. And I thought last week that we were on the verge, not least because the British government briefed the British press to the effect that Sunak was going to tell Netanyahu that Britain had concluded that Israel was committing war crimes in Gaza and that it would therefore be impossible for the British government to continue selling weapons and participating in intelligence collaboration with a military action which they had legal advice to the effect was breaking war crime and prohibition of crimes against humanity and potentially even the ultimate crime of genocide. That's what we were led to believe the British government were going to do 
following the horrific murder of seven foreign aid workers, three of them British military veterans who were systematically, deliberately murdered by Israel just a week or so ago. But they've recovered their bottle. They've recovered their confidence. David Cameron said today that Britain will not be halting arms sales to Netanyahu's regime. Blinken and Austin and one American spokesman after another stated incredibly that they had seen no evidence that Israel was involved in the crime of genocide, presumably meaning they have no mobile telephone, have no computer, have no television at home or in the office, because the rest of the world has seen it in blood red technicolor for six months and more. So the Americans and the British are doubling down in support of this genocide. Britain's arms contribution is in quantum quite small. It's nothing like as big as the arms sales of Germany to Israel, which have increased tenfold over the last six months, ten times greater than they were the previous year. The government of Nicaragua, to its eternal credit, has mounted a powerful case this week before the International Court of Justice, that Germany too is complicit in the crime of genocide by not just arming but exponentially increasing the number of weapons, shells and other military hardware that it has provided for Netanyahu to conduct these crazed, unhinged, genocidal massacres. I don't know what the ICJ verdict will be. I'm no longer even sure that it will be worth the paper that it's written on in any case. Because I'm so old, I remember that very same ICJ sending Israel for trial, plausibly, their word, accused of genocide. I'm so old, I remember the ICJ ordering Israel, ordering them, to halt, cease, and desist a long list of things that they were demonstrably doing on the basis that they would compound the crime of genocide on which they were sending Israel for trial, declaring that Israel had a case to answer on South Africa's charges, that they had crossed the threshold and were now involved in the ultimate crime of genocide. But Germany and Britain and the United States governments are all acting against the express wishes of the vast majority of their own people, who in ever increasing massive majorities demand a ceasefire now, an end to the occupation now and a Palestinian state now. The fact that governments in Western countries can so ignore the vast majority of their own people proves overwhelmingly that, boy, do you live in some kind of democracy. We've got some great guests tonight. It's going to be the mother of all talk shows.